Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that the church is triumphant. And then in the end, as the book of Revelation has pointed out to us, that we will be victorious and spend eternity with you. We thank you for that assurance. And we thank you that persons from every nations and tribe will be part of that great company of hosts that enter your kingdom. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week I compared a local congregation to a passenger ship on a voyage down the river. And the destination is the safe harbor of God's eternal city. And there are many ships, many ships, all making their way to that same destination. And one of those ships is named Fairview Church. It docked in 1979, 40 years ago, and people began to come on board. And there on the ship, we did life together. Ate together, worshiped together, played together, served together. And from time to time, at various places and at various times along the river, we would dock and some people would get on and others would get off. But we were all headed to the same destination. And we can be thankful that while we were together on that ship, we were able to move further down and we were able to have an influence on all the persons that came on board with us. We were able to influence them and they were able to influence us. We were blessed by the contributions they made while they were with us. And as the Fairview Church ship was floating down the river, those on board could look out and become aware of different needs at the various stops that we made along the river. We became aware that if others were going to arrive at God's eternal city, they needed to get on board a ship that was going to take them there. And one of those ships was steered by the Stevensons, Tim and Colleen Stevenson. And the, this couple have been serving in Uganda and other parts of Africa for many years. And they've been trying to get people on board of a ship that will take them to the eternal city. And we know in order to get people on the ship, it takes a lot of different activities to get people to see their need of being on a ship that will lead them closer to God and his kingdom. And so all kinds of projects have been developed to help, but to get people on board. And things like child sponsorships, sponsoring youth conventions, helping provide land for the TAP program that ministers to persons with AIDS, goats for the Jajas, the grandmothers who are looking after grandchildren, of, of, uh, of children whose parents had died because of AIDS and involved in, in helping. And we have been involved in all of those things that I have just mentioned. Another ship began sailing to Sri Lanka in the 1980s. We were among three churches, one in Japan, one in the States, and our congregation that helped to launch the work of the Church of God in Sri Lanka. And those churches are now training pastors, training leaders, and also involved in humanitarian works. And on our journey, we also became aware of another ship that was traveling, Partners International. Through this organization, we were able to support two missionaries uh, to uh, Indonesia and another in Nepal. And then we assisted others who came uh, uh, aboard our ship to share their story. Uh, you recall the uh, Disjardins, Richard and Catherine Disjardin served with the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Ken and Kelly Oldham came by on their way to um, Egypt. Daniel and Christy Kim on their way to the Netherlands. Uh, the Beverleys to um, well, that's the, uh, the, the uh, De Francisco's to Spain. And here are the uh, Beverly's. 
uh, serving in uh, Sri Lanka. And then we had uh, Marsha, or um, yeah, Marshall and Terry Lawrence, who are involved with Silent Blessings Ministry, uh, ministry to the deaf. And all these came to share their story with us, and we provided them with generous offerings to send them on their way. And then uh, we realized that there were some new ships sailing along the river, and so we helped in planting some new congregations here in uh, Ontario. And also, we helped uh, to support our college, Gardner College in Camrose, Alberta, for many years. And from our ship, we also sent out our people to assist other ships in other parts of the world. Linda Sparks was the first person that went out from our congregation. It was through the ministry of this congregation that Linda became a follower of Christ, and we had the privilege of baptizing her. Uh, she was a wonderful pianist that played for us, but after she made her commitment to Christ, she went to Emmanuel Bible College to prepare for mission service. She married a missionary and uh, went over to Spain. And very sadly, while she was in Spain, she uh, had food poisoning and from complications from that, she passed away. But we had a very significant part in, in Linda coming to faith. It was your love and concern for her that loved her into the kingdom. Another person that was on our ship as a young person was Julian Wig. And uh, he made his uh, commitment to Christ at a uh, camp meeting here in Ontario. And uh, we had the privilege of uh, baptizing him. And he too felt called to ministry, and so he enrolled in Gardner College. And um, after he graduated, he became one of the, um, the teachers there. And uh, here he is with a singing group that he brought to uh, our church when they were traveling for um, the college. And uh, after leaving Gardner, he pastored uh, uh, two or three churches and uh, is now serving at a counseling center for youth in um, Edmonton. In 2008, Barb Helm felt a call to take a ship that would take her to Asia for her mission work. And uh, she first went on a short-term uh, basis and then she felt called to go into a uh, long-term basis. And I just want to share the story that, uh, that she sent to be shared uh, with us uh, today. She writes, To my Fairview family, uh, by the time you hear this, I should have landed back in Asia. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you to celebrate 40 years of worship and ministry for the Lord, but know that in my heart, I rejoice with you. I think it was about 25 years ago that I first arrived at Fairview. From the beginning, I felt welcomed and at home. Not only did I love the cultural diversity, but the generational diversity, that everyone from tots to seniors was included in church family activities, made a deep impression on me and helped me to know that I had found a real church home. You were there to walk with me and encourage me through my seminary studies, allowing me to put into practice some of what I was learning. It was through Friendship Connection, a community outreach program that a number of us organized in the early 2000s that I began to learn about what is now my adopted culture and country. Though at the time I had absolutely no idea of what God had in store for my future. From the time I began to follow Jesus, I sensed a call to cross-cultural outreach and ministry, but for many years I just assumed that it would always be in Toronto. When, as I neared graduation, God used an email from John Johnson, who was then director of uh, Church of God Missions for Asia, um, this email to reveal his call to serve in Asia. You commissioned me for a short-term uh, trip in 2006, then continue to encourage and support me through the decision to leave my behind my career on Bay Street to follow God's call in a new direction, commission me first for a year of campus ministry. 
and then walking along with me through the process of transitioning to long-term service. Commissioned me again in 2010 to my current location, first for language study, then more campus ministry, and my role with a group of international friends focused on bringing the love of Christ and the message of the good news to the Chuasai people. In John 10, Jesus says, I'm come that they might have life and have it abundantly. His purpose isn't to give an abundance of money, houses, cars, possessions, or any other worldly thing, but an abundance of life. Walking in obedience to him is the best life, even if some of that journey seems difficult. So as you celebrate 40 years of faithfulness at Fairview, I give thanks to God for all of you, Pastor Bittner and Dina, Pastor Kilburn in my early years there, and each of you who have been a part of my family at Fairview and part of the abundance of life that has been mine for more than half of those 40 years. God bless you all now and forevermore in his love. Barb. Fairview Church has also assisted with several offshore projects. We've been um, involved in um, various humanitarian projects that have provided physical as well as spiritual and emotional support. For many years, from the very earliest days, we began supporting Cedar Home Orphanage in um, Lebanon. Lebanon. And uh, we also provided funds when they were going through the war there. In addition to that, um, we've provided funds for uh, tsunami relief in uh, 2004 in Asia and Japan, then in 2010, uh, you know, the Katrina hurricane in Florida in 2005, uh, the flooding in the Philippines, earthquake and flood relief in Pakistan in 2009, relief for Sudan in 2011, and uh, earthquake relief in Haiti in uh, 2010, uh, and then the Nepal earthquake relief in uh, 2015, hurricane relief in uh, 2017. Uh, so in all these uh, places, we have had a part in bringing the love and concern of our church to these. In addition, we have given uh, care packages to pastors and medical supplies. Uh, we helped with medical relief for Baby Johnson in uh, Uganda, uh, funds for displaced persons as a result of the war in Sri Lanka, refugee support uh, for war-torn Goma in the Congo. So the Fairview Church has also made it possible for persons from our congregation to step off our ship and travel to other parts of the world and be involved in mission adventures there. And uh, I'm thankful uh, for that. And the first group that we, spent, that we sent went out in 2003. And uh, we have one of the persons that was on that. Nishari is going to come and uh, share with us about um, her um, experience there. Thank you. Well, let me just first start by saying um, I was 11 when I joined the congregation just a few years ago. Uh, so I'm glad to be part of uh, the 40 years here at Fairview. I actually wasn't on the 2003 trip. I was invited, but I just didn't quite make it. Uh, 2003 was a pretty tough year. Um, Mom was going through treatment and, you know, things weren't possible, but um, I promised uh, Pranitha and Daniel and Loji, who were on the first trip, that if it came up again, I wouldn't say no. And uh, I guess fortunately or unfortunately for me, it came up two years later in 2005. Um, and so there were actually, f I think there were seven of us 
sorry, there were five of us going in 2005, and only two ended up going with Julie and Ken. Um, unfortunately, Daniel and David couldn't come. Uh, they, uh, Mr. Chalaya was very ill, and uh, he, they couldn't make it. Um, I didn't really, really want to go to Africa in the first place. Why would I go somewhere uh, a little uncomfortable, out of my comfort zone? Um, so definitely um, meeting Ken and Julie um, and talking about the different reasons there's camp meeting or sorry work camps going. Um, you know we've heard about the Stevensons. I had met them at church, and you know we didn't really quite understand this whole mission trip idea. What do we do? Uh, we talked about going to Nevis uh, for those of us who were in our teens at this church. We, I think we raised some funds for it, and it never got off and never happened. Uh, so meeting with Ken and Julie, they wanted to put a camp to, uh, work camp together um, to sort of expose people at, at the Church of God um, movement, in the movement, in, especially in Eastern Canada, to the work that's being done by Colleen and um, Tim in Uganda. And also, if, as you know, with many Canadian charities, they had to go to make sure that the money that we send is being used in the proper way. And so that was really a two-part reason for this tour. Uh, so preparing for that, um, we had two goals. One was to make sure that the, work, um, the sponsorship program was evaluated. So uh, we spent a lot of time traipsing around <laughs> from different villages to villages, sitting under lots of, lots of uh, trees waiting for things to happen. Um, but also we were there to observe and to experience other ways in which people were being helped. Um, the trip was only two weeks, so it wasn't too hard. Um, some of the things that I was able to do uh, was to work with the TAP program, so it's the Chimaini AIDS Prevention Program. AIDS is a pretty big um, concern in Africa, and a lot of that can be changed through education, but I think the way the church approaches it is to model good behavior. So that is, you know, modeling the, um, you know, marriage where it's, you know, uh, it's committed relationships where you uh, are there for the, you know, to have a family and it's uh, make, making sure that there isn't multiple wives, which is a problem in parts of uh, Africa. So that was uh, one of the programs, and in that pro in uh, the AIDS prevention program, the idea was this um, setting up microcredit loans, which is an interesting concept. I'd never heard of that before. So that was educational. The idea of helping people help themselves. So not that we give money and they do whatever they whatever they need, but that we we help them discover their own. Um, their own businesses and invest in their own businesses through this microcredit. So the initial seed funding is there, and then the rest of that is really dependent on the participants. So some of the programs they have is this beads, uh, which I'm wearing one. Uh, we sold them many times, uh, recycled paper made into beads and sold, um, mostly to tourists or to people visiting. The other, uh, other program was this cow program, which is interesting because uh, when we were there, there was this German girl named Annika who was all with us, and her uh, role was to, um, to take account or inventory the cows that have been given out by the church and, and to brand them, which I'm sure was very fun. <laughs> so she took this big branding iron with the Church of God symbol <laughs> out with one of our workers. Uh, poor thing, I think she was uh, tremendously stressed out. Um, also the fact that she had to wear a skirt uh, most days. Um, and they, the idea of this cow is you, you're given to one of those jajas who had, you know, really had to raise their children's children. So they had already parented um, their children and now their children had passed away because they had either contacted AIDS or other diseases and now they were responsible for parenting another set of children. And sometimes, uh, you know, obviously being older, they were not working and they weren't able to um, provide for these children. So this cow would be given to them. They would raise it, and the um, the basis of pro propagating this work was that they would give the first calf back to the program to be given to another family. So in essence, creating, you know, 
a different uh, an economy that doesn't depend on constantly getting money from outside. Um, so we had that, and then we also had uh, many visits to the churches on Sundays, and um, sometimes we had, I think we had a village visit that year uh, for a conference, which was three days long, which um, was very taxing, including a snake in, the, in my tent. Um, so I didn't sleep a lot. As my mother would know, I'm not really fond of uh, bugs. Dirt I can deal with, bugs I don't. So um, it was interesting. I actually did not go to the washroom for a whole 72 hours, which I will tell you is not good for your body and you cannot be done 10 years later or 15 years later. <laughs> Some of the things I, I think I took away from the trip uh, Obviously, we were there to uh, encourage the local workers and the workers in the field. That's definitely a reason. But it also helped me see that the needs up front. You know, it was, it's one thing to hear about it from somebody else. It's another thing to observe from your, from your own perspective. Um, it's a good way to find out if this is what, li what life is about or if this, what, this is a life you want to have. Uh, Danny and Logi certainly... Uh, realized that this is something that they would like to do and have gone back many times and this short time is a good way to investigate that if you're young and you want to think about a career in the, in the mission field. Um, one of the things I, I learned from this trip is that solutions in North America do not work in Africa. And it's important to uh, realize that. So as we travel from village to village, we travel on these roads that were um, invested or uh, provided by foreign governments. You know, there's a big sign saying the government of Japan or the government of Australia has built it. And it's like that uh, story where you build your house upon the sand versus the rock, where they just piled up a bunch of sand and, and tarred it over, and thinking that that would work. But it doesn't work in Africa, because rains come, sand shifts. So a lot of the money provided by these governments really are going to waste. So it was a really eye-opening experience. Um, added to that was um, one of those days when nothing seemed to go to plan. I was. Uh, tasked with taking books out of the, um, the recent uh, delivery of a, a unit from somewhere in, in the US. So it's basically a hot day. Now they've stuck me in a hot container to go through books. And so as a librarian was trying to explain to me the Dewey Decimal System, which I had succeeded not to learn in school, I'm sure my sister wouldn't be very upset. Uh, he was trying to explain to me, we found books that were shipped with great cost to Africa, some of which really didn't make sense. Um, one of them I remember is dating in North America. And I was thinking, there was like several copies of it. It was probably done in the 1960s. Uh, reading, leafing through the book, I thought, oh, it's just crazy. Some of these don't apply, um, and even less so. So a lesson there for me was to make sure that when we're giving to projects or things, to make it relevant and to make sure it fits the solution for the place. Along with that was about 20 computer uh, manuals with brand new shiny uh, five by eight floppy disks. Also need a computer <laughs> to run it. That didn't come with the, <laughs> the shipment. Uh, neither did the electricity. Um, so it just you know, made me think as a, as a young person at the time, you know, if I'm giving money or, or taking the effort to put something in a container and ship it across the world, should it make sense for that purpose uh, to be used there? Uh, the other thing I realized is we can't really solve everything. You know, we can't really solve all the, the world's problems, and it's really daunting. There were days when, at the end of the day, when we come back, uh, it was really hard to um, sort of understand what was going on. But just to remember that, like a pebble in a rip that ripples in the water, whatever you do can, has a ripple effect. Uh, one of the projects we saw um, that's really close to Tim's heart, which really we don't do much about at Fairview, is the well project. So Tim has this well project that he gets a lot of sponsorship from, the, especially the German Church of God, um, where he builds wells at villages. And you know he, it's, he's very passionate about it. So when you're building a well in a village, you're not helping one person. It is the one act, but it really does help the whole community. Um, it's the same thing with the sponsorship. When we give to a child, it's not really necessarily the one 
uh, child you're helping, but just the family and the community. But again, that responsibility of giving to the right cause. Um, we're talking about this at, the, at dinner, usually conversations around the day, but uh, overhead costs for many of the charities that we give to, we don't question. We know we just give it and we write a check. But a lot of the money that we have given is lost in overhead. And one of the good things about programs that are more grassroots, like um, the sponsorship, is that more dollars go to uh, administ uh, less sorry to the end goal and less to the administration. So that was some of the things I took away. Um, I did go to a second work camp, and, but I'm going to let Danu talk about that. Um, just for those, the youth that are planning to go, the young adults, uh, I know it's only young adults, but even if you're 18, 18 or 80, I would encourage you to go, step out of your comfort zone, and learn a little bit about other places in need. Thank you. Um, so a couple of years after the Uganda trip, we were, oh, oh, wrong way, sorry. We were looking for um, another opportunity for a work camp. And I think in 2008, Daniel and Loji were back in Uganda at this time, I, th I think. Because I think our plan was to try to go back to Uganda as well, but the timing just didn't work out. The Stevensons couldn't accommodate uh, a work camp from Fairview at that point. So we, um, I, and I don't remember exactly how we managed to do this, but we got in touch with the Hoffmans, who are Tim and Colleen's parents. And they, at that time, were in Zambia. Um, so, and we learned that there was a work camp from Western Canada that was going. So we um, attached ourselves to that work camp, and it was um, uh, Pranitha Nishari. Oh, it's really fuzzy. Sorry. It wasn't fuzzy on my computer. Um, Pranitha and Shari, um, Charon, Miriam, uh, David, and myself, and we joined the uh, the Western Canada team, and we worked with the um, the local leadership there. And the, the main purpose of us going there was to help to rebuild a tailoring school in the main compound in um, Lusaka, which is the ca capital of Zambia, the Church of God compound there. Um, is there a way to make this less fuzzy? No? Okay. Sorry. Okay, so we, as you can see, through the very fuzzy pictures, hopefully you can see, we did a lot of fundraising actually up front before we went. Uh, I don't now remember how much we managed to raise, but I know we did some fundraising activities here. We managed to get some corporate sponsorship. Um, so in addition to the work team, uh, the team that actually did go, we um, were able to provide a lot of financial support for the, the raw material that needed to be purchased for this construction project. Um, so we were in Lusaka for about two weeks. Um, we did some construction work. I can't tell you that our um, our skills were the best fit for the job, um, but we helped out where we can. You know, uh, Shari supervised. <laughs> David uh, poured some water on some mortar. <laughs> I laid a couple of bricks, um, but I think. So more, more than us actually being there and our practical skills, it was um, being able to work with the local church leader. So just about every single person on that construction site, other than the foreman and I think a, a welder that was actually hired, everyone else there was part of the local church leadership. So they were pastors from all across the country who had traveled to Lusaka to be with the work camp for the, t for the two weeks. And they're the ones who actually built that that school, you know, they, all the, the people that you saw in the previous pictures who were on the scaffolding, who laid the brick, who framed out the windows and the doors, it was them. And then we helped out where we could. Um, but, you know, we, because we were together for two days, two weeks, sorry, during the day we were uh, building, in the evenings we would have fellowship time together. Um, and I think that's what I take, took away from this work camp. It wasn't the practical aspect of us being there building a work, building a building. It was um, working with the local pastors. It's, we were able to put names and faces. It wasn't the foreign church in, or the church in a foreign country. It was actual people and being able to see what these people, how, how they serve. And a lot of times in actually in very difficult situations, you know, they have families that they do support back in their own villages and they left them behind to come and 
work on this project um, and like the, what they are able to do with the little that they do have, it was incredible. So that's, I think a lot, and sorry, you probably would agree too, that's probably one of the highlights from this trip was to be able to spend that much time with the pastors um, and to learn from them and, and view them as people. Um, another one uh, thing that I remember a lot from this work camp was working with the Hoffmans themselves, that's um, Stan and Marion, who are Colleen's parents. I don't know how many decades they've been in Africa. It's probably like, I don't know, 60, 60, 50 to 60 years in various parts of Africa. And at this point, um, I think they had come back to Canada and had returned to Zambia because they felt the need there. Um, truly incredible people. A few years after this work camp, we had them join us here for a retreat. I think it was 2011 or 12. Something. something like that. Um, just amazing to be with them and see how after so many years they are still continuing to serve, the joy that they have, the dedication that they have. Um, and then also the, at that point at that point in time the local church leaders, um, Oscar and Miles and Dow, uh, Miles also came here to visit us a few, she did right? I'm not imagining that. Okay, a few years later. Um, it was the, when we were in Zambia, it was um, the, the, the leadership was going through a bit of a difficult time. We didn't know anything about it. We just found ourselves in the midst of it. Um, I don't know that we were able to help very much, but hopefully uh, we were able to encourage them to keep on with their work, to be able to support them. Um, but they, both of them as well, just amazing, amazing people. Uh, the, what, I re reiterate what I said before. This this particular work camp, it wasn't more. It wasn't so much about the work that we were able to do. It's the people that we were able to meet and to work with. Uh, and as with most of these short-term work camps, um, as Nishari mentioned, we did do church visits, and we also did some village visits. The um, the compound that we were staying in in Lusaka had a nursery school. Uh, there was one e afternoon that we sort of had a fair type event for the local kids uh, who attended that, that school. We went to a village one week on a Sunday, I think it was a Sunday, uh, near Lusaka. Um, those are the bottom two pictures that you cannot see, sorry. Um, and then in Livingston, that's where the Hoffmans were based off, that's the top right picture, we went to the Songwe Church. Um, that then, it was just a mud building with a thatched roof, and a few years later, we helped to fundraise to actually build a permanent structure there. And unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of that one, but um, it was, it's, you know, to be able to visit the church, and then a few years later, to help actually, uh, help to build a, a permanent structure that's, you know, without having been there and seeing that need, we, that's not something that we would have been able to do. Um, we did some village visits as well, and we, we took some gifts for the kids, and I think in, in Songway we took some, um, uh, there's like an older lady that we went and visited at her house, I call it a house, but it was, you know, it's a hut with um, some stables. I think we sort of took some food and some rice and things. But again, it wasn't the practical things we were able to do. It was um, the joy that the, the people we were able to meet, that uh, the appreciation, like they were so glad to see us. It's, it's about these tiny little villages that they never get visitors to be able to see someone from Canada come all the way to see them like they were truly appreciative of it it's such a little thing to do just to go and go spend a few hours with them they were so happy to see us and it was in, in for us in turn to see the joy that it brought them that's that's what I take away took away from this trip um, and I think that's actually all I had yeah that is all that I had but um, it's it's uh, Nishari touched on that too it's um, you see it's it's, it's different in Africa, and what we do here doesn't necessarily, is it the same there, but at least going, you do see how it's different there, and um, you, you, you'll get to see how much it means to them. More than anything, it's, it's yeah, it's the joy. It's being able to uh, share and to fellowship with people in another part of the country, from another part of the world, um, and the, the, sorry, I don't know what I'm going to say. Kind of running out of words to say it's it's the fellowship it's that experience of being able to share with people that's that's 
what a lot of these short-term work camps will give you. Um, if you're like Daniel Noji, if you're able to go for a long, or Barb, if you're able to go for a longer period of time, there's more practical things that you certainly can do. It's not always possible in a short-term camp, um, but it's an experience that you'll never forget. And I hope the pastor you mentioned, there is a team that's hoping to go from here. Truly encourage you to go because it, it will change how you view, how you live here, you live your life here in Canada and realize how truly blessed you are to have what you do have. Amen. Thank you, Dana. In 2015, we had a commissioned prayer for Jonathan, and he's going to come and share uh, with us now. Jonathan, come running up here. Time is running out. Hi everybody, I, was, I wrote everything down, so serving God at home and abroad. Serving God seems to be self-explanatory, or is it? Well, let's just jump into it. I went to South Asia almost five years ago. It's been a very long time. So here are some pictures of the mission trip to South Asia to refresh both of our memories. Oops, other way. Oh, was it the other way? Oh, there we go. Why is it this right there? In the first picture, this is a group that I've gone with to South Asia. With the team, we spent a month trying to connect with students like ourselves. So there's a whole group over there. In the second picture, this is the picture with Moses and his team. He led a lot of rescue missions of women trapped in the sex trade. So we volunteered with them with, with Moses and his team for a few days, just like with, he had a lot of camps for the little children that were rescued with their mothers. And so there were some things that we did there that was, for me, that was very useful. Uh, like, changed, it changed my heart. So my highlight for the trip, though, was understanding the power of the Bible. We were able to talk to this one girl going through the loss of her father. And we tried to tell her about God, but it didn't have any effect on her. Like personally, it didn't like we tried saying everything, like you know, you know, all these things didn't do anything. But then, you know, we gave her like a, a copy of the Hindi Bible, and she's you know sh sh showing her verses like Psalm 23 and some other passages, and she really felt God's comfort. We prayed for her, and the next day her prayer her prayer got answered actually. Uh, we gave so we gave her that Bible, and, and sadly we weren't able to keep contact with her because her number changed. But I have faith that when God starts something, He will finish it. I do have a few con uh, contact with a few people over there still, and I still try to keep relationships with them, but, you know, to bring about God all the time, you know, people, people don't want to talk about, there are most, of, most of the people don't want to talk about God all the time, so you, you try to, you know, put a, put, a, put a seed in there and, you know, talk about other things, and, you know, you're just waiting, waiting to grow, like, like, wait for the garden to grow, right? So, um, for every church gave me most of the funding that I was able to go on the mission trip. It was definitely all God's grace and mercy to be able to experience this. In, in Matthew chapter uh, 13, verses four, 44 to 46, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from the joy, and from joy over, he goes and sells all that he has, why is that field? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. In the five years after this trip, this has impacted me significantly. God changed me during these five years, and the kingdom is really like a pearl to me. We cannot save others if we're not saved ourselves. If God is not precious to us, then you sharing to others won't sh show why Jesus is different. God has slowly made my heart see the importance of his kingdom. Life is short. I'm 25 years old. I'm working. I'm a grown-up adult. I'm going to work in the morning. Monday to Friday goes by so quick, just like that, with a finger snap. Is there more to life? I believe so. Because Jesus said he came to give life and give it abundantly. When Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew chapter 28, it says... 
But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee. Well, I don't think you really see it on the actual slide. I kind of didn't realize it was smaller fonts. But I'll read it. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore make, back, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Lo, I am with you even till the end of the age. Uh, Jesus is with us. Do you guys believe that? Sometimes it, it doesn't feel like that. But the word of God really means what it says. I have faith that he is with us, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. God is a promise keeper. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 18, Jesus gave three parables of the three servants. Uh, it says, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who calls on his slaves and entrusts his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another each of his own ability. He went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, hid his master's money. These three servants represent two types of people in the church. See, God gave us all something to do, some more than others. But the way we respond to the gospel is fundamental. If we really have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we would really have a desire to share our faith with others because it's truly what saved us. If it saved us, we wouldn't even want to share the life gra gracious gift to others. See, when we stepped out in faith, I learned God is faithful. Two Fridays ago, I went up to meet with my good friend. And the, the crazy thing about this is like, I, he, lived, he used to live right beside my townhouse. Like, but I never met him there. I never met him where I lived. I met him in, in, university, in Guelph, of university in Guelph, and we became close friends, and now we just go together. We literally, we go together and have fellowship, and you know, we started, now we, what we started doing is we started just going out and like sharing with people. And, and last Friday was really amazing because we, we met three types of people. The three types of people were, one of them were like a group of kind of Christians that are kind of like our age, but you know, they were kind of people that I could, we could kind of tell that they didn't really have a relationship with God. It was kind of like, you know, he had a tattoo of a cross, and you know, we asked him what it meant. He was like, you know, Christianity. And, you know, my friend asked him, like, you know, have you ever felt, felt like the Holy Spirit? And he's like, they were all like, kind of confused by that question. And they were, they were like, maybe the Holy Spirit flew by my head or something. And I, maybe I missed it or something like that. And, you know, we kind of just like had small talk. The second people, the second guy we saw, he was just sitting on a bench. And we just asked him, like, if he had any prayer concerns or anything like that. And, you know, he just said, like, you know, my back was hurting. And, you know, he was like, I think he was on a, like, a, fr a buddy's wedding. And he held, held up his his friend just for like, you know, they held him up and then he's, he said after that, like his back started to hurt. So we said that we asked him we can pray for him and then we did pray for him. And then after that, he said he felt 30% better after when we prayed for him. So, and then after that, you know, we, just, we were just telling him how like, you know, our stories, like, you know, both, and both of us at one point, you know, we were not, we were, we were kind of away from God at one point, you know, maybe we went to church or did this, but we were telling him that, you know, God loves him and, you know, he took it and he kind of, he didn't really want to talk that much. Like, he kind of just like, oh, that's cool, but maybe he got freaked out, but that, that he actually felt better after we prayed. So, and then there was another guy, actually, when we were about to go home, my friend wanted to go home now, so. <laughs> but then we saw this one guy and I saw him, like, you know, he looks like a cool guy to talk to, let's just try talking to him. And then we ended up being a homeless guy and he was, he had HIV and, you know, he was actually listening for 30, 40 minutes, actually, to what we had to say. And we were just talking back and forth. He had some weird theories about a lot of weird things. But we, I just told him that, you know, God can change your circumstance and that, you know, we'll pray for you. And we prayed for him, like, praying that his HIV would go away. And in faith, I'm believing that his HIV is gone because I believe God can heal today. I don't know if you guys believe it still, but I believe God can heal today. I, the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's still the same God. If he did it in the Bible, why can't he do it here? He can do it today. It's just, a, it's, just, it's just our unbelief. We think, oh, we have technology, we have this, we have that. How can all these things happen? It looks like a story. It looks like a myth. Until you experience it, then you realize, wow, that God is actually real. God's still here. God's still doing crazy things. So, like, when we were talking back and forth, we prayed for him. I actually had a Bible, and, he, and he, at first he didn't want to take it, but he took it after. And I told him, like, you know, 
God can change your circumstance, like, and God can restore all the broken relationships, all the things that you went through, and, you know, he was really taking it in, and, you know, we just, you know, go in faith that God's going to change all the circumstances. I'm like, maybe I'll, next time I see you, you might be Prime Minister of Canada or something, and I'm like, I, I believe it, that God can change his circumstances. So, um, I just wanted to say that as, as part of my story, that the reason why for all of us to go on the mission field, the mission field is not just like going out, out and abroad, but it's also here. It's all the people who are in your sphere of influence, who the people you influence, who the people you talk to, do, talk to daily. You know, maybe it's just the same people you see every day, and you just say, hi, what's up, and you know, you got coffee time, and you know, you just talk about random stuff, or you, you know, you, whatever you talk about. But you know, if you really cared about these people, you would want to bring the, God, the light to them. You would want to be like, hey, like these people need, like they're, they're living, they're, we're living in a world that's passing by. The, uh, it's passing, passing in sin. It's not, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse before it gets better, before Jesus comes back. So uh, I, just, I just believe that everything happens. And I just want to end off with, there's a thing I wrote that I kind of, like, because I kind of, kind of, kind of drifted off my script a bit. Um, yeah, the, I guess I, the reason why I brought up the, the three servants is, like, what's, which, which uh, servant do you identify with? Uh, which servant are you? Are the one that, you know, do you feel like you just, like, hit the hole, put everything in the ground that God gave you and you're not really doing anything with it? Or are you the one that you feel like you're doing a little bit with it? You know, you know it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be, like, you, kind of condemnation. God can, start, God can start someone using 80, someone that's 80 years old, someone that's 90. I met a guy who started, before that, he lived a kind of, like, nor, normal life, and then at 81 or something, 80, no, at 73, he, he had a vision from the Lord, and he started, he started doing God's work. And, like, so you, can, you don't need to be too low. You can start today, whenever God calls you. You just, you just have to be willing to listen to his voice. Uh, I, I pray that Fairview Church of God continues in its growth and its journey because, you know, there have been amazing people that have, done, that have gone out, like Barb and people, and there are people in the church that are doing things that, that we may not see. Maybe we make judgments and we think, oh, this person is doing that. How do we know? Only God knows what people are, people are doing. But I pray that if we continue in its growth to share the faith and bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, we see even more fruits than what we have now because we have a lot of fruits now, but... We keep going on because, you know, Jesus is going to come back in the next 40 years, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not saying that's a prophecy because no one can know except the Father alone. So I know that. But uh, looking at the world today, all the current problems and situations, we're going more and more into sin. We're becoming the days like Noah. We're, we're getting slowly, slowly into the days like Noah. People are just caring about themselves. The love is growing so cold. So he will come back during that time. And, you know, Christians, you know, you've seen the climate for Christians now is not very tolerant. People don't like Christians. People don't like Christians. They make a lot of accusations against Christians. And there's, I mean, there are mistakes Christians have made over the centuries, but Jesus is the reason for the season. So I pray for that, that in the next 40 years before he returns, I want Jesus to say to all of us, well done, son, well done, daughter, well done, for every church of God. I'll just put that Thank you to all of you who have um, shared, and um, I'm going to have one more person, or a couple of persons that are sharing, but they're not here in person. Uh, I want to share what uh, Daniel and um, Loji have uh, sent for us to uh, share uh, with you uh, today. Oops. Okay. Yeah, that's when we had the... Uh, prayer for them when they um, left. As members of Fairview Church, we were encouraged from a young age to be active in church ministry, whether it was being part of the choir, playing instruments, helping ushering, or running a homework club. The church was always supportive of any ministry opportunities we undertook. This really helped to shape our interest in ministry abroad. Having an interest in missions, we were blessed to be part of a work camp to Uganda in 23 that was organized by Eastern Canada. We have subsequently returned to work in Uganda at three different times. Our work in Uganda has primarily centered around our teaching and administrative jobs at Heritage Christian School, Heritage International School, a project of the Church of God Mission and four other missions. Working in Uganda has helped us to connect with our sister congregations here. Over the years here, 
We have helped organize youth events and been able to encourage congregations and schools with Kampala and surrounding regions with visits. Fairview Church has been a key partner in our ministry in Uganda. When we see needs here, Fairview is always more than ready to help out. During our various years in Uganda, individual members of Fairview as well as the church as a whole have helped improve church buildings, provided income generating projects such as goats for vulnerable people such as uh, grandmothers and those with AIDS, assisted with youth events, and provided musical instruments for churches. Most recently, Fairview has generously provided funds to purchase Bibles, which are often too expensive for many people here. We hope that through Fairview, many will be able to read the Bible in their own language and that their lives will be transformed by the message of Christ. So we can see that as we have been going down the river as um, Fairview Church, uh, a lot of people have been touched and it's amazing the number of, of people and places that have been encouraged and blessed by the ministry of this church through finances, prayer, and personnel. And with God's help, we have created a concern for the needs of the world, and we celebrate the various places and persons across the world that have been touched through our concerns. And all of these activities have enabled persons across the world to move, to move further down the river and closer to the destiny that God has for us and them. We're going to close by singing the song, Song for the Nations. And would you stand?